He was raised on rock and roll and Sinatra. He drinks whiskey and dirty martinis. He once gave tours inside of a 65 foot wooden elephant on a beach near Atlantic City. He's your host, E.T., and this is Rock on the Rocks. Uh, we have a great guest, Terry Reed, uh, legend in the in the rock and roll world. And you know, before he comes up, we're going to bring on one of my friends to make us a drink for the show. But before that, uh, let me bring on producer Chris to uh, get us ready. Hey, producer Chris here. This is a big one for you, man. This is a big, is, big episode. Is. Yeah, you know, um, this went from a possible potential uh restraining order to a 20-year friendship <laughs> it could have gone either way i love um, how those work out yeah right usually they don't um this one did uh it's crazy man so you know i don't think it's any secret that i am a fan of the led zeppelin band and uh, a buddy of mine i used to own a nightclub with uh, one of his other spots was a music club and a friend of mine was managing and he kept inviting me to these Monday nights. He's like, oh, you're going to love it. There's all these great um, people from bands that you know and love all jamming on Monday nights. And he would tell me the list. And I was working like six nights a week at this other place. And I just never got down there for a few months. And finally, he's like, I don't know what you're waiting for. And he goes through the list again and ends with Terry Reed. And I'm like, you didn't say Terry Reed the first time. <laughs> and he was like, he's like, I didn't know you would know who he was. I'm like, yeah, man, I have records of his. I've I love him. And um, he's like, well, he plays every Monday. And then I'm like, I couldn't believe it. So obviously next Monday I went and, you know, Terry Reed, who, you know, we'll see in the show, he just has done so much in his career and, and so revered by so many artists that we love, loved him and, and, you know, such a powerful voice. And there I'm at in like a club that holds a hundred people watching him sing. So, you know, because I knew the manager, I could like get places I shouldn't get and get introduced to him. And he wanted nothing to do with me. And I was so disheartened. I'm like, I can't, like, I want to be buddies, but he won't talk to me. And eventually my, my friend was leaving that gig. He got another full-time job and couldn't do it. So I called my old partner and I said, Hey, I heard you're looking for a new Monday night bar manager. He's like, yeah. I'm like, I'm in. He's like, what? I'm like, yeah, I'll do it. I like, He's like, I thought you were working over the other place. I'm like, I am, but I'm off Mondays. Let's make it happen. So yeah, I took the gig and, you know, once I was the bartender and there was that trust between me and the guys in the band and Terry, you know, we, we started hitting it off a little bit and, you know, once in a while we might stay late after the bar closed. And I literally would sit there till five in the morning and listen to Terry tell stories about just festivals and tours and people that you love and, and just crazy stuff. And, you know, not only is he beyond talented, but he's the nicest guy in the world. And, and you'll just see, he's just so lovable and, you know, full of energy still. I mean, you know, I, I think I was at his 70th birthday a year ago and he played at his birthday party. Um, and he still sounds great. You've done a it's lot crazy. of cool things and had a lot of cool experiences. I know uh, Terry Reed's about to come up, so I'll be quick. But uh, is this, I mean, you don't have to always pick favorites, but is this on the list for uh, moments in your life? Yeah, you know, look, to be honest, um, when I was working at that bar, a buddy of mine uh, who had done really well for himself uh, in, I don't remember, some finance kind of job, and I, he was out in L.A. visiting, I took him to see Terry, and I was telling him a little bit about Terry's story. And I was like, yeah, I would love to make a documentary about Terry's life. And he's like, well, how much would that cost? And I'm like, I don't know. And I threw out like a ballpark figure that I thought, you know, to shoot would cost. He's like, all right, I'll write your check tomorrow, make the movie. And I was like, what? And I called Terry and told him, you know, I just got financed to make a movie about his life. <laughs> and, you know, it was crazy. We started shooting and, and then nothing with Terry, but there was another person involved on the business end of things that just wasn't, I didn't think, uh, making decisions for the right reasons. And all I was doing, like, I didn't expect this movie to, to ever make money, but if it did, I wanted Terry to make money because it was, you know, out of love for him. Sure. And, but I couldn't work it out with this other guy and it just fell apart. It's such a shame. So, you know, 
this isn't a movie, but I'm happy to have Terry here telling those stories and, you know, um, letting people know a little bit more about him because it's, there's a couple of things about his career that are always grab the headlines, but having heard so many stories, there's just so much more beneath, you know, it's like, once you peel that onion, there's just so many layers to Terry and his life and his career and his songs and just, you know, I'm happy. To, I'm happy. To have, so yeah, it's definitely one of those. When I started the show, I'm like, I need to get Terry Reed on the show. I'm excited for you, man. Yeah, it's cool. And this, this just came today, the album behind me, that's his first album. Um, <laughs> I've been it's looking amazing. for a copy Yeah, and uh, it, I finally found one. I didn't want to get one that's like in fair condition. I'm really going to play it. So this one's in really good condition. At least the album, the cover's a little beat up. And I, like three weeks ago, I found it. So I'm like, great, I can have it for the show. And I was talking to my wife yesterday. I'm like, ah, that album never showed up. That's such a bummer. And this morning it came. So there you have it. Okie dokie. Let's, uh... Yeah, man. <laughs> so good stuff. Um, but yeah, man, I'm excited. I'm excited. So look, let's get this bartender on. Let's make this drink. Let's get settled in. And let's, let's hear some Terry Reed stories. Congratulations, ET. Thank you, pal. All right, well, welcome to the show, Banjo. Um, thank you, you know, thank you, Claire. Thanks for having me. Hey, look, you're one of my uh, not only favorite people when I travel the country, I'm always looking forward to see you, but also our music discussions always are yeah. a highlight of my trips. You know, I, I've, Absolutely. I feel like every time I come see you at the bar, the night ends with your shift ending, us sitting on the other side of the bar talking music. 100 percent it's uh I, I feel the same way and i, I always look forward to, to to seeing you and out of town and uh the few times that i've been down to la and have been uh able to to cross paths with you down there and then also just like the the phone calls of late have been have been really wonderful too it's um it's just been a nice uh respite from from every day and uh i've, I've been enjoying getting to know you and becoming your friend and obviously talking about rock and roll and I feel like that's pretty much all we talk about anymore. It's a little catch up, yeah. a little bar stuff, and then and then just straight into to music, which is perfect. It's you know one of the things that I love the most. Yeah, why not? I mean, it's uh, you know, I think music music cures the world, so why not make that the focus instead of all the bad stuff happening? Agreed. Now, especially now, you know, yeah, for sure. Um, so basically, you're you're going to kick off our show tonight with a cocktail. So if anybody. Um, you know, watching wants to, to make this themselves, they can along with you or make it later or just enjoy whatever they're going to have during the show. But what, uh, what are you going to make for us tonight? Uh, this is, um, this is basically just a Manhattan riff. Uh, I'm a huge Manhattan fan and this time of year kind of calls, uh, specifically to them. Uh, obviously, you know, big, big whiskey drinker. Whiskey is the, the drink of choice of so many rock and rollers. Uh, that I thought it was also kind of appropriate. Uh, but this is just a slight little twist that I like to do. Um, I have, I've got some vermouth here. This is um, Carpano Antico, which is in an unlabeled bottle, but I've infused it with uh, coffee beans overnight. Um, so I took roughly a, a 750 bottle, 750 ml bottle of vermouth and added about 350 grams of uh, whole coffee beans to it, let it sit overnight, and then just dump the beans off. So I've got this really nice um, coffee infused vermouth and then obviously a bottle of um, you know Jack Daniels right here which is which is wonderful so we're basically just gonna make a, a sweet little uh, variation on a, on a Manhattan um, that I think is great I kind of like loosely titled it um, Southern Accents which is one of my favorite Tom Petty albums uh, right. I've been on a huge Tom Petty kick lately so I thought it was a nice little uh, tribute to him um, so the the vermouth Infusion process is super simple, um, and then we're basically just going to do like a um, a real easy Manhattan, which is a two to one ratio of whiskey to vermouth. So two parts whiskey to one part vermouth, and then uh, we'll stir it up and have ourselves a nice little uh, afternoon treat. That's awesome. It's funny you bring up yeah. Tom Petty because I feel like that's been a uh, a recent go-to to mine and we haven't ever discussed this uh wildflowers has been a in my rotation a lot lately so did you get the remaster kind of re um i guess it is a remaster with all the um i guess they're calling it all the rest all the little extra right. you know songs and whatnot did you get a copy of that i haven't you know i've been on this like 
grabbing up all of the original stuff before I feel like it okay. either people let their basement flood and it goes away or they just hold on to it. So I've been buying a lot of, yeah. or e even though I think the sound is better on a lot of these reissues because they've remastered them, there's something about owning the album that came out in 78, owning that copy. To me, I, agree. I don't know. I've got, um, you know, there's, they never really did. I mean, I guess they did a wildflowers issue on vinyl, which I never got a copy of. Um, but I have two of his, his albums that are my absolute favorites are the, the first, the original Tom Petty and the Heartbreakers, and then the second one, which is called You're Gonna Get It. And both of those albums are two albums that I always put in kind of rotation when there's like new music that comes out, new rock and roll records come out. I'm like, okay, how does this compare to other rock and roll records of the past? And those two Tom Petty albums are what I kind of put up against almost all modern rock records because they are so perfect. And I don't own new cop or new issues of those new reissues of those it's still just the originals and you know there's like hisses and cracks and pops and fizzes right. and, and bumps and whatever but they still just sound awesome all the way through and it's a great testament to to, to tom petty too is just like how good they still sound i mean he really spent a lot of time you know mastering his stuff in the studio um so after a couple, you know, a good uh, 30, 45 seconds of stir, we'll just strain it into our nice little coupe glass here, uh, or martini shell, uh, whatever you have there. And then uh, I got some, some lovely uh, Dirty Sioux whiskey cherries here that were sent to me by a dear friend. And uh, I always think that a Manhattan should be garnished with a cherry. Um, orange peel, if you like, but a, uh, a cherry is, is my preference. And, uh, and there you have it. No, beautiful. I will uh, I'll toast you from afar. Yeah. To you, my friend. To you. Cheers. And to rock and roll. Oh, man, that is delicious. Now, um, it's funny. You mentioned your litmus test of new rock, comparing it to those two Tom Petty records. And it's funny because I was reading this morning, Sinatra, he had a similar test, but for food. So he was oh, obsessed okay. with red sauce, and he called it Sunday sauce. And when he would go to an Italian restaurant for the first time, his first course was always spaghetti marinara. And if he, if he felt like they nailed the marinara sauce, he would feel good right. about ordering the rest of his meal. Oh, I like that. I've never, I, I never heard that. Um, I just started watching that Sinatra documentary on Netflix. Have you seen that yet? Which one? The, there's a few. It's the Palm Springs one. I think it's. No, it's like a two-parter, kind of about you know, definitely like his early life and kind of his progression on. Um, I just watched the first part, uh, and it goes, I can't remember what year it stops, but, um, you know, I've never been, I've always liked Sinatra quite a bit, but he's never been kind of on my like heavy rotation, you know, of gotcha. material that I, that I that gravitate to, or I don't know about you. I mean, I, you know, I grew up with my, my, my dad was all Sinatra all the time. So, you know, and my mom was the rock and roll side of my family. So. I listened to a lot of Sinatra and my grandparents, yeah. you know, that was their scene. And it was funny because I, I, I feel like I should have shied away from Sinatra later in life because it's stuff my parents listened to and my grandparents listened to, but I just kept digging it more. <laughs> like a nice. <Yeah>. Um, <laughs> but speaking of stuff you do like, which is, is, uh, or that you do gravitate towards rock and roll. So now that we have your, your cocktail, um, and it, it's aptly named. So would you suggest that's the song that we should listen to a Tom Petty song while, while sipping that drink? Uh, I mean, that one's, that one's pretty, uh, pretty, pretty heavily appropriate. It's, it is nice and soft. Um, you know, so it wouldn't detract too much from all that. Johnny Cash has a great cover of it, which I think is, you know, pretty awesome as well. Also Johnny Cash is a big fan of Jack Daniels. Um, so I think that's kind of highly appropriate. Um, again, it's, it's, it's not my favorite, Tom Petty album, but I have been listening to it a lot lately. I think there's, there's some really um, undiscovered material on there. It's also produced by Dave Stewart of the Eurythmics, which you know he never right. produced any other Tom Petty albums, and it seems kind of like a weird choice. Um, you know, so the album's got this really like weird poppy, like progressive vibe to it. There's horns on a bunch of tracks, and obviously, "Don't Come Around Here No More" is on there. 
Um, and now that I'm talking about the entire album, it sounds like that um, maybe it is gravitating into one of my <laughs> favorites. Uh, the, the more I realize that I, you know, know a little bit more about it and stuff. Uh, yeah, I think that's, that's, that's a great choice. Let's do it. Yeah. All right. Now, do you think, uh, super generic question, but always fun. Do you think you could pick a desert island album? I don't think I could do a singular album. I, I certainly have had this conversation with a lot of people about, you know, five to 10 uh, albums that you would choose. Um, but as, as, as you mentioned that, I did realize that, you know, there are obviously albums that we have all purchased multiple times over and over and over on various formats. And I think the album that I have purchased the most on um, CD, because I wore it out so much when I was much younger, and that I have multiple copies of here on vinyl is uh, the Beatles Revolver. Uh, I think that that is probably the most perfect, perfect um, pop rock and roll album, you know, kind of ever made. And I have been, you know, I think I probably bought three different CD copies of it because I wore them out so much. And then I've got at least three vinyl copies of it here. Um, I think that is, that's the one that I probably gravitate towards the most in terms of what's been in the most rotation uh, for right. my for my entire like musical life. Uh, right, and look, you can never go wrong minutes. with it. Yeah. Beatles like the Beatles, minutes man. Long, 14 tracks, man, just, it's just a banger every time. There's more <laughs> hooks and riffs and like ideas crammed into 29 minutes and like 50 seconds than most bands have in their entire careers. I mean, it's it just like every time you listen to it, whether it's the, the stereo version or the mono versions or the remasters or whatever, it still blows my mind. Tomorrow Never Knows might be the most perfect rock and roll track of all time. Um, this is a debate that I've had with you know many of people that you and I will obviously probably get into at some point. Look, this is exactly what I miss, man, about you coming to LA or me coming to Portland is, is, is this nightcap and a uh, uh, talking about music. So I appreciate you coming on and, and sharing some stories and knowledge yeah. and a great cocktail i cheers you i cheers you thank you brother good to see you, you bud and um you too yeah be well and hopefully i uh, will see you soon i hope to see you soon too man it's been great to catch up with you and uh talk rock and roll sounds good you know i gotta be honest when i came up with the idea to do uh, a podcast bot, whatever they're called, vidcast, um, with, you know, musicians and people in the music business. The first person I thought of was you. So I'm really happy to have you here today and that you, uh, took some time out of your life to come talk to us. So thank you for that. No, no, yes, we go, but we go way back. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Every time I for see sure. you, I, I get a giggle, you know, it's like all that we went through at that joint club. Oh yeah, yeah. I mean, that was a that was just a, a whole episode in anybody in your and my life, right? <laughs> yeah, it really was. I mean, that was a a moment in time that I don't in my lifetime I've never seen that little bubble of magic happen for so long, right? Yeah. Just yeah. you know, you guys on stage. For those of you that, that don't know what we're talking about, there's a yeah, used to be a club in L.A. Um, a music venue, and um, a buddy of mine owned it. And on Monday nights, it was like a, just a super group of musicians. And Terry was the main singer of this group. And it was well, uh, no, Neil. I, but that, that we do in my interview, but let's, let's be fair. It was, <laughs> it was, there were many lead singers in the group. I have never been on stage. I swear to you, I've done gigs all my life. But I've never been on stage with so many great people in my life. I mean, you know, I mean, you've got Bernard Fowler, who's a great singer in his right. own right. You know, I know he works with the Stones and he sings, but that's a tough gig to, to get things right behind Mick anyway, because <laughs> I wouldn't get them wrong. <laughs> You'll know about it, right? And right. Uh, you've got Rick, the bass player, who, who, who goes way back, like with Neil. Don't get that one wrong either, you know. And Phil Jones from Tom Petty and, and all this. And then, we didn't realize this is the, I don't know whether you realize the ET is that we'd sit over at Rick's. You went over there a couple of times, you know, we were over at Rick's house in the valley and, uh, 
me and, and Wally Wartell, who played with everybody, right? Right. And uh, we're sitting there one night. We, 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 our thing was we'd get together and play songs that we liked that we never got a chance to ever do. And now you've got all these different guys that were in very famous bands like the Eagles or <laughs> Neil Young or, and everything. So they've got enough songs that they've written to play. So you never get to do My Girl or and a hundred and she's not there and all these incredible songs that we you know now i'm from, being from england there's a whole english section that i could cover and then you got waddy who worked with everybody including keith and everything so okay. all this thing we sit talking and then one night i don't know whether it was you et or yeah i think it was you somebody said to us came over to rick's and said you ever thought of doing this live and we went, nah, I don't know about that. It's, it, and we said, well, look, we got a Monday night slot. Do you want to come over and give it a try? So we all went, well, yeah, that'll last about two weeks. And that'll be the end of that, right? <laughs> right. And we were laughing. Funny that we know, careful what you wish for. It ended up, what was it, E.T.? It was like three like years. Two or three years, yeah. Yeah. I, I do a, you know, as a residency. But what we didn't realize well we knew that we knew all these people because we'd sit talking about all our friends all the time but little did we know they would all turn up when they found out we were at that club and all want to get up and be part of it right yeah i mean they're incurable you know like keith keith's the best, the best one i mean he, he turns up with his friend that photographer and just turns out okay what what song are we going to do now we know every song that he ever did <laughs> Right. So, and what are you being, you know, playing with him a lot? So it was so much fun. I mean, God away. Like you yeah, say, from... oh, I'm the lead. You, when you said I'm the lead singer, I mean, I did background vocals to Keith. And then one night I jumped in on Street Fighting Man. And what he said to me, you know, Keith was figuring on singing that himself. <laughs> and Keith went, yeah, that was fine. <laughs> he didn't care. And then singing harmony with Donovan, and ay, 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 it went on. And Everyone, Roger, Roger Daltrey, Daltrey came. Yeah. You remember that we did incredible. The Kids Are All Stay. Right? I mean, I, to me, that was an honored moment to do The Kids Are All Right. You also I, did I, Stand I, By Me, which was amazing. Yeah, that? I, know, did... I know. All them songs, you see, like when Who Were the High Numbers in London, and I started off with them, oh, God, amazing, at the Marquee Club in London, which is famous now. And, uh, and it was just a black a hole in a wall with black walls, you know, one of them deals. But it, it had a sound. And uh, I mean, it started like with John Mayle and Alexis Corner and, and a lot of them early things, right? And um, it was fantastic, you know, and Mick Taylor, you know, we all have stories. Me and Mick talk about stories from there. And Peter Green, God, I mean, right. all that started at the marquee. Then all of a sudden you had this head change you had the who come along now. Now you don't want them in your living room. God's truth. <laughs> there goes your furniture, right? You know. <laughs> and uh, I was there. I I done a, this get the first gig with them when they changed their their names from the high numbers, right? Yeah. To the who, and the whole deal was they got this whole new image now. They got a deal with Marshalls, who said if you can break all the amps up and we'll give you more. Right? <laughs> It's, it's very straight. So nobody saw it coming. The audience had no idea what they were going to do. So they did. They did anywhere, anyhow. That my generation wasn't out yet. But, so they did that and smashed everything up. I am in the audience going, "What the? <laughs> I, <laughs> I didn't see it coming. It was just nobody told anybody. It was like shush." And uh, it was amazing when you think about it, you know. And then when Roger turned up at the joint, just get back to what we were talking about, is that he, he, said, he said to me where he was suddenly going, yeah, it's her, yeah. <laughs> it's been a while. Eh? He says, yeah, you, he said, you and Keith were really good friends, weren't you? And I went, yeah, yeah, I know. Yeah, he goes, I feel sorry for you. <laughs> you know? Because it was always very dangerous hanging out with Keith. So it, it was like one of them, you know, great guys. Well, how, how old were you when you went on tour with the Stones the first time? 
Oh, yeah, about 12. No, no, no I was 15, you know. You're 15 years it's old on toward the Rolling 15. Stones. I was 15, and then I, I had my I had my first, 16th birthday, which is November, as you know. <laughs> right? Right. My 16th birthday, like halfway through the tour. Because the whole tour, I think they wanted to roll it out by Christmas sort of thing, right? And um, it was like a three, four-week tour, and it was us. Uh, I started the show, and then it was Ike and Tina Turner Review, which is hundreds of people, which is, I could even, I do know what I can name all of them, but that's not important. Uh, but playing with Ike and Tina Turner was, it's kind of changed your life, right? I mean, they go, they go on, and you go, why am I do? What am I doing? <laughs> this is they're doing everything that I love, right? You know, gosh, geez, maybe I'll be able to get and get my head around that sometime. So they do that. Then the Yardbirds would come on, which was the beginning of all that whole thing. Which was Jimmy, it was Jimmy Page on one side, on the right side, and Jeff Beck on the left. If you were standing in the back, right, you know, <laughs> right, 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 and they had. Before the Stones went on next, they had twice the amps that the Stones had. They had those, I don't know if you know what beetle amps are, super beetles, right? These big swing cabinets, right? And okay. an AC30 as a, as a preamp driver for all the guys out there that know, right? So, <laughs> and it was, it was horrendous, right? Be before we get to that tour, in between the yeah, first right. tour and the second tour, um, Aretha Franklin's famous for saying, about the London music scene, there's only three things happening in London: the Beatles, the Stones, and Terry Reid. Yeah, that's yeah, true, I know, right? I, know. I agree with her. Yeah, I, no, no, no. <laughs> you do agree with her? <laughs> no, no, I paid her a fortune for it. You can't imagine how much. It no, no. What was that no, like? I'm, because no, having heard no, that, well, it's between being very happy and it, it's sort of you having a total nervous breakdown. You know, I mean. What does that mean you've got to do now? I don't know. She came to a gig. I, I'll, I'll set it up. If it's for her to say. It's not, it's nothing to do with me, right? And we, we do this club called uh, the Revolution Club. And me, Joe Cocker, Steve Wim, everybody would do this. It's a, a, like a guest club. It's very, very upscale. Michael Caine, everybody, you know. Uh, well, guests, I don't know. If you were somebody, you would get in, put it that way. <laughs> right. right? And uh, we had everybody there, you know, Peter Cook and Dudley Moore, you know, we'd interrupt everything you would do, right? And Sean Connery and uh, God bless him. And uh, all these, you would look at the audience, it was it. And one night, I looked in the audience, and I'm singing away, and I, I know, you know what? He, he, that lady sitting in the audience looks like double of Aretha Franklin. God, I swear she looks just like, but she's having a, she's cheering, having a great time and everything on the, ah, she, she wouldn't be up to make a fool of herself with me like that. <laughs> you know, she wouldn't be, I mean, God, that looks like her, right? So I do the set, I mean, seriously in my mind, I just went, not could it be, I just was going, God, she looks like, I, in my mind, I hadn't heard she was in London or anything. So we get to the end of the, end of the set, and I go to the side of the stage, and this guy says, go over there. Miss Arma Ertigan wants to talk to you, right? And I went, I know that guy. He's the head of it, right? And I go over there, and Arma says, come over here. I want to introduce you to Arita. I just died. I, I died. I still am dead from that. <laughs> I still have never got over the shock. I mean, I got to an hour later, but I've never got over that. You know, Arita is the queen of song, you know, right? And uh, she was just very kind to me for a say nice sake. You know, I don't know, something hit a nerve, most something we were doing. And you you really have no idea of that, you know. <laughs> you don't know what that really means. You can't go back and listen to yourself and say, right. what did it mean to like, you know. <laughs> you just realise that you've listened to Wilson Pickett, Otis Redding, right? uh, Joe Tex, <laughs> Aretha Frank, right? Right? Ray Charles, that's... That's what you grew up on, and that's the only thing you like. Well, maybe it's rubbing off a little. <laughs> maybe, right. maybe you're doing something that well, you know. You know, look, that's very that humble of you, but 
a lot of people no, listen it, to all it, those it you know, artists. You never know what you you never know what you're really doing. But when you ask me, what do you do? What are you fight? And said, "Hey, that's the that's the stuff." Well, you know, that's the stuff. And she didn't say that. But, you know, right. Start with an X. You know. Yeah, mm -hmm. that's that. That is cool. Now, the Stones tour in '69. So that yeah. the Maisel Brothers they filmed the whole tour, and you right. opened the whole tour, right? With Ike and Tina uh -huh. Turner again, or. Or is that uh, the Grateful Dead? Were they on there? Um, but you didn't do the last show, right? No. Now, well, no. how, I, I've heard you say well, it, it. We were in Boston, okay? We did Boston Garden, which is not there anymore, because you know. So we did Boston Garden, and I'm going, oh, that's it. It was like 46, you know, and one day off Sunday every week, which Keith called Laundry Day. <laughs> and I, I said to him, what the hell do you mean by laundry day? What do you call I said, he said, well, have you ever tried to put all your stuff in on Sunday and the laundry is closed? <laughs> I said, yeah, well, wait. He said, well, just throw it out the window and go shopping. <laughs> I went and get some new clothes. He said, they smell so bad anyway. <laughs> you know what? <laughs> and I go, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Now, it's a very road thing, right? Now, that was his thing. So we work six days a week, and and what we do is we do the do a gig, fly out that night to the next city, not sleep, forget right. that. No, no, no. Keith, <laughs> Keith, at this point in his life, I don't think he Keith wouldn't sleep for two weeks at a bloody time or something. And, and we get there and we party. Keith would have three different parties in different hotels around the city where we were going. We land about three, four in the morning, right? party all night god yeah get to the hotel that was booked and crawl in at about I don't know, eight nine in the morning oh dear hearing me and i crawl into bed and then like go uh oh no uh, 11 o'clock we're flying out to the next city where uh detroit to chicago whatever and then we get there then we either sleep on the plane or do something then go to sound check Right. They wouldn't. They never say on check. Right? No. <laughs> they never say on check. Uh, you know uh, why? Why is uh, Mick Taylor says why ruin a good gig by rehearsing? <laughs> you know, <laughs> it's true. Like so, they go off and do what they're doing, and uh, we get something to eat. We go to sound check, do the gig, and go. You know, hello Cleveland. That's <laughs> you probably could have been Chicago. You don't know where you are, right? And then fly out of there to the next gig and three more parties and the only peace and quiet i ever got on that tour was on stage <laughs> right. you know, the rest of it was just uh was on my, it's too much fun we should not have had that much fun it was just way too much fun but the thing about the last gig is we get to boston after like 38 46 something like that i don't even remember as you can imagine right so we get to the last one and, and the key knocks on my door. I hear the door knock and I said, yeah. And he goes, oh, he says, so Terry, are you, are you going to go to Altamont, you know, to the last gig in, in Oakland? I went, well, I've been on the phone and I've talked to a couple of friends and they say that it's not going well. The day before, remember when they're dead and you know, <laughs> they would finish to play. <laughs> so, because he was like freaking out, you know. And I'm wanting you know, listen to all this, you know. And Graham called a lot of people called and said, I don't think you should go. He said, The people got guns and shit, and and, uh, and they get you know, the uh, they gave drugs and and uh, they gave drugs and booze, you know, which was a norm for Bill Graham to give to the angels, you know. I mean, I got on with the angels, great, but. Seeing that they ran most of the drugs in Oakland, California, anyway, I don't think they needed any more. <laughs> you know, and I'm going, this is a, this is a bad remedy. So, you know, speed and boost is like, oh, it's, it can get very dangerous. Though. And you, you look at everybody's faces on that thing and it tells a story. Right? Oh, uh, everybody was so lit. I mean, you know, everybody's tripping and oh, it was really dangerous. And it went wrong, you know. So yeah. I said, hey, I, if it's all the same to you, I, I don't want to go home. I'm really tired. I said, it's not the gigs. It's like partying with you. It's worn the hell out of me. <laughs> you know? He goes, 
Well, he says, I don't particularly want to go either, but I suppose I got to. And I said, well, I think you better, or there'll be, there'll be a riot, you know. They would have great if they'd known it in Candlesticks Park, where they originally tried to get the license, right? I think it would have been a great, it would have been a good event, you know, because that was would have brought it all back home ground from the beginning with the dead in the airplane. And I talked to them as well, and they, they agreed, you know, but the city wouldn't give them a license to do it in Candlestick Park, you know. Petty, right. really. That was that bloody raceway out in Oakland. It was, ah, uh, it's a drag strip, you know. I love drag strips, but, you know, <laughs> you know it's a, it was a bit dangerous. Now, the after that, that's, you know, leading up to uh, River. So that was the album you did with, with Atlantic and Ahmed Erdogan. Um, yeah. And, you know, if I, I was looking back, I even found this, uh, looking through some old stuff I had. I don't know if you remember this. Oh, my God. Well, <laughs> well <laughs> on that one. <laughs> Fat Angel. Wait, no, show me that. What's that? Fat Angel. Where's that? I don't know. It was like a hand-typed, printed, like, magazine. Like, someone stapled this together. It was like a... Yeah, like a, I, I don't know. A I hippie magazine, maybe. I don't know. I don't know. Um, but it's from yeah. London because yeah. it was, yeah. it cost 10 pence. So it definitely was from London. But I was reading a bunch of reviews of River and yeah. it's astounding how much love there was for that record and your yeah. songwriting and your voice. And even with all the great musicians you had, there all the reviews said the star of the album is Terry's voice. And it's crazy. I don't know if what Atlantic record spend twenty five dollars on promotion. Like, how come no one knows that record? Ha! You know what I mean. Like, and I, very... I remember Rolling Stone, and maybe I think it was Rolling Stone. I could be wrong. You probably know. Um, like two thousand five or something. They said the twenty five best albums you never heard of, and that was on that list. Yeah, I know. I know. I saw that. You know, and it's. I never sit, I'll be honest with you, I never sit and try and figure out why <laughs> these things are or are not, you know, and, uh, you know, as you well know, they, they, you know, that's a good thing and a nice thing for you to say, and that was a nice quote that you pull out, and one of the nice things happened to you, because most of my albums weren't necessarily just released, they escaped, you know, <laughs> <laughs> you know, they, it's like, you know, you'd be like, if you could find them, now, they, I don't know, they, they, people bootleg them all. But uh, the thing was, is I think there was a bit of a pensive situation of, well, what's he going to do now? Because there was a bunch of things bubbling of what I might do at the time. And then when I signed with, with Armin Ergen, who signed me personally to him, you know, after the Aretha thing and all that, he signed me personally to himself and then to Atlantic Records. So he oversaw everything I did. He got me Tom Dale to... Because it right. all went wrong in England. He knew when he got me out of that with Mickey Moe situation that we'd been together three years and all good things, no, 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 you know, get a bit worn out. But what happened was David Lindley got an offer to, um, he, with a, a gentleman called Jackson Brown, <laughs> who was on Atlantic. Now, I knew all this was going down because he's on his label. And they, you put a record out, who knows? It went to number one, Doctor My Eyes, right? Now, right. J Jackson's hanging out with us in England. We're all hanging out together. And Jackson went, oh, Terry, oh, I said, what's wrong with you? I said, you're around. You know, you went around. Were you, were you, what's happening? And uh, he says, well, I just heard from back home. He said, the record just went to number one. Now that's him and all the eagles and all that thing who I haven't met yet, right? But uh, he said, God, he said, but, oh, he said, you know, they want me to go on the road. I'm at one. He said, uh, what are you doing? I said, well, I'm, I'm just trying to finish this album with R River, right? With Eddie Offord, okay? Remember, producing. And I'm trying to finish this album. And uh, what, what, you got a funny look. What did he said, well, I'd like to have david for a while to go on tour i said with the number one record i said oh, come on you mean that's it <laughs> that's the last time i'll see david <laughs> right you know it's, i mean it doesn't go downhill from there it only goes up 
I said, look, I'm not the kind, with all the rubbish I've been through, I am not the guy that will stand in the way of somebody who can finally make good. You know, I mean, come on. I said, that's fine. I said, look, I said, I'm trying to figure out what how to fill this is up. Now, so we had another few days in the studio. Then all of a sudden, uh, Eddie Offer turned around to me and said, Alan wants to talk to you. So now Alan had been, Alan White had been really good to me. He'd been doing uh, John Lennon's album, Imagine, right? <laughs> right. And John Lennon called me up and let us do gigs because he said, I don't want you to get into the problem at our band lab and get blackballed if you don't, if you're three, if you don't do it three times in a row, you never play that circuit. Same with any band, right? He said, our band had the same problem. And I'm going, yeah, right. Oh, the people, that's great. <laughs> you know, you tend to forget. Right? So John was really Wait, good. You're at saying if you that. skip a gig, like if you don't show up to a gig. Three times, get... three times you're out. That's the college university circuit. We called it the bread and butter circuit in England. Okay. Which it was. They paid more money. It's regular. You did good. You, you nail it the first time. You're coming back in two months or less. Right. You get a hit record, damn, you're back in two weeks. <laughs> but they will book you and pay you. They are, obviously, they can pay you more because they have a subsidy. They have a, a you know, a, a whole thing of money, you know, an allowance for entertainment to pay. At, you know, Durham, Newcastle University, let's see, all these big universities and that, they got no end of money, right? And uh, all the big bands and and what up and coming ones, we all grew through the university circuit. I don't care what they say. That's what happened. That's the only way you could really stay alive and earn money but without having a record. Right? It was like internet bands when that started, and it became really big on the internet, but without even having a record. Right? You know, it's the same difference. You know, but um. Gotcha, gotcha. That was, yeah, it was really good. Rod Stewart and all them and everybody, you know, all started from that university circuit, you know. And, uh, but then Alan turned around and said, well, I'm going to join, yes. I said, no. <laughs> <laughs> and he goes, yes. I said, he said, no. Now, I know all Chris Squire and all, all best friends and that, you know, and Ian Anderson. So, yeah, you try and answer, I mean, yeah. So we, we all, we all known each other forever, right? So I said, well, would he, he really? He said, yeah, and Eddie's going. So now I don't have a producer. The drummers, who, who we, me and Lee Miles, oh, yeah, the bass player, Lee Miles, who me and him founded the group. We, we don't have a group anymore. We, we worked for a, a year and a half to put that whole thing together, the what we called the perfect group. You know, right? I listen back to it, and it really, it really is it. I mean, it, it, you listen to some of these um, whistle tests, uh, things i was listening the other day uh my wife had one on and said what is this and i went eh, that's funky <laughs> it was cooking you know oh man yeah. smoking so oh god jesus but there's kind you get combinations of people you put together that to do a certain thing and it's amazing what can come off you know anyway we did that we did that and then when they all broke up and me and me and lee miles ended up standing in a snowfield looking going what happened you know and I, he said well man i'm going back to la and i went so am i he goes yeah come on so we both i talked to him uh, and he said don't don't freak he said i'll give you some money get your house come you like la i love it he said come to la check it out relax for a couple of months he said and i'll get you a producer he said I tell you what, how about Tom Dale? And I went, Tom Dale? Are you, how are you, are you joking? He said, no, he'd love to do it. I said, let's start tomorrow. He said, no, no, just chill out for a bit. And he took care of me. Look, look the days of Arm uh, Erdick and, and Jerry Wetzer and all those very musical business, musical people. And uh, it, it's I, I miss all that, you know. I bet the young guys do too. There's, it's, it's you, you. I miss a lot of those ones that would really have the power, and they would look after people. I remember one night in particular, you were doing Paint It Black, and I literally I had chills. <laughs> and customers were like, "Hey, can I get a beer?" I'm like, "What? No, look, 
Like, pay attention to what's going on up there. This is magic. Yeah, like, right. I'm not. I'm not serving you right now. I, know, I think I screamed at you a couple of times, being late on my scotch and coke. Yeah, uh, probably. Probably. <laughs> when, we doing that, when I was doing that, I, I, we, everybody was like, God, because I'd be on for th like one song, then I'd be off. And then I'd be waiting around, waiting around there. Oh, you're on. Okay, right. Hey, eat it. Get me a drink. Get me a drink. <laughs> it was like, boy, it was like, yeah, it was but like I... something called a circus. It was like being in a circus, you know. It was nuts. It really was. And, yeah. you know, the the people, the band itself was amazing. And then you're right. Oh, yeah. The revolving door, like, of people that showed up. The one night I wasn't there was when Robert Plant showed up. Yeah. Oh. Uh, I there. wasn't there. Of course, that's the night I miss. Um, and yeah. then you guys sang together, which is cool. Yeah, right? we did. We did season of the witch. He wanted to do, which I did a while ago. You know, no. And these, he's a ride love Rob. You know, I mean, bugger me. We go so far back and all that. You know, and uh, everybody says you knew oh, him. God. You knew him when he was in the band of joy. Yeah, yeah, that's right. We see. I knew him way before it all. And, and uh, you know, he was in a local band like we've all been in. Right, and they were pretty good, but it was he. I we did a gig together, and him and the drummer. I'm like watching the two, and I've been in you know, I've been around a little at this point, right? You know, we stones to it and all this stuff, right? And I've been watching some really good bands, <laughs> and I'm going, that drummer and that singer, that drummer is off. The, oh, he said. Ginger's gonna be so pissed off when he sees this guy. <laughs> I wonder if he. I said the first thing I said. I said to John Bottom when we were. I went to, on that gig because there was. Uh, they started off the gig. Then I was next, and then a guy called Tim Rose from America right. that had Morning Dew, the song Morning right. Dew. He was in England touring on the basis of. So I went over to John. I said, "Have you ever met Ginger?" <laughs> and he goes, "No." I went. Thank God for that. Right? I said, boy, is he <laughs> going to be surprised? He said, why? I said, no, nothing. Right? <laughs> you know? and, and then I suddenly realized that John Bonham had a not unlike attitude that Ginger had. And if the two of them get together, this might not be a pretty picture, right? Which later on is in a whole other story. <laughs> oh, God almighty. Putting them two together is like two lions in a room. But that's great, right? But that, the singer, drummer, drummer, singer thing, I could see that's how that whole thing works in a band. You know, guitar thing's always an icing on the cake, even though right. with that thing, with Jimmy, he wrote all the parts and they were all those licks that we'd loved for years where the train kept a roll in and, <laughs> and all these licks that, from Screaming Lord Such and the Savages and God knows what, you know, things that we all loved that he brought to the fore and then made a whole platform for him which was fantastic right. made it work it's good yeah no it, it it's yeah. cool it, it, but it's also cool like you know so you 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 guys both were on a bill with tim rose which a lot of people today probably don't know who he is and i probably only know him because in like 2002 um robert plant had an album and he and he did morning dew yeah and then I, I went and looked up the song and found who out Tim Rose was. Oh, did you? Oh, you see? Yeah. There you go. I think it was an album called American Sun that he wrote. Right. Um, and that was where that song was that I, you know, I didn't know at the time Plant didn't write that. Yeah. I just. Yeah. Was but, it, right? you see, it was interesting because see, there's another, okay, you got Tim Rose here who had been around in America for somewhere between country and that R&B sudden thing, Muscle Shoals, something. I'm not sure where Tim Rose came from, but, but say I'm very sorry. I worked when I was like 13 or 14. I was in a, with my friend Peter J, who I tell you about. We, we, we did a, the support band to Del Shannon all over England and Ireland and a whole load of gigs, right? So I got to know Del. God, man, it's an icon, you know. And, yep. and I got to sing Runaway every night. I was sing, I sang harmony. I mean, I was in heaven, you know. <laughs> I, I got the record and everything. And so I knew the song. And when we went to rehearsals, Dale looked at me and went, you know the song? I went, I don't even know it. I've, I've had the record before you were born. <laughs> and anyway, we got on really well. And he was a lovely guy. But there were very, there were some guys coming over from America that were very iconic, you know. 
I mean, I put him in that Conway Twitty sort of thing. Really, right. you, you know, you, you, you sing three notes and you know who they are. They have a, an original stature about the whole thing. It's very special, you know? Yeah, no, it's, it's, it's crazy when you just, you can hear a guitar lick or you can hear a voice, you're like, that's yeah. so-and-so. And you also met another one that's pretty iconic um, on probably you can't not know from their guitar is Hendrix. Did uh, you yeah, hang with him yeah. a little bit? Yeah. Tell me a story once where, where he played your guitar and you're like, that's it, I'll, I'm out. Yeah, yeah. no, we did. He came over to my house. He came over to my house because he could never tell anybody to leave from his apartment right in London. And he get, he get his parties going. That's all the good all the girls, and, and the blondes here, and brunettes there. You know. Okay, so we got it all organised. <laughs> and we got the drug dealer and the and the liquor there. And everything. And then of course it all gets freaking out of control. And you've got more people turn up, more blondes, more brunettes, and and then Jim is like, yeah, man, well, cool, man, shit. <laughs> and then. Then he, he can't, he can't tell anybody to leave. So they do all these drugs and drink all these liquor. Now I'm not saying that in a bad way, right? He just keep ordering more. Yeah, it, it was immaterial, right? But then he go, I said, I need a bit of peace and quiet, right? You know? And uh, so he called me up I the middle of, Terry, who's this? It's Jim. I said, yeah, Jim, what's the matter? Now I just probably rolled in from a gig from up north in England at like, you know, five, four in, right in the morning. And he's just trying to get it. And he says, oh, can I come over and crash me? Because, man, it says bad over here, man. So I said, I can't hardly hear him because of all the din in the background, mate. And I went, who is he? I said, why, why, why do you tell him to leave? He said, oh, I can't do that, man. Oh, man. <laughs> yeah, that's not cool. So he, he's such a nice guy. He couldn't do that. So I said, oh, come on over. So he come over. There was one point where he spent two days at mine. I didn't see him. We went back on gigs and he was there when I got back. Right. So he caught up on his sleep, you know, and then he went back yeah. to party. But he come by and one night we sitting there and he come by and uh, we got a gig the next morning and he just caught it. We got in at two o'clock. He got there at three and he said, man, I've been listening to that record of yours. And I went, why would you do a stupid thing like He said, no, I really like, there's that one song, man, I love that song, man. What's it called, man? I went, well, you got to tell me what it's called. And then I'll tell you how stupid it is to be listen. Anyway, he, no, put the, you got to hear it. It's, it's a record. Put it on me. He said, he, I put one on. He goes, no, it ain't. And he's got the guitar. He goes, no, it ain't that one. And then he played next to it. No, it ain't that one. I went, is he please taking the beat? He's putting me on here. So we got the next one. And I went, no. And he says, no, it goes like this. And he goes, and I go, well, I don't know what that is. It's nothing I did. He goes, play the next one. He played the next one. That's it. Look. And he's playing along with it. And it suddenly dawned on me that when you listen to Hendrix Records, there's him playing guitar. And him playing another guitar, like counterpoint, and he's playing bass, right? So the bass is weaving right between two counterpoint guitar players. This guy's nuts, right? So anyway, he's playing like this, and he's playing along with his song of mine, and I, and it sound, it made sense while he's playing. And then when I stop the record and he keeps playing, I go, "That's nothing like it." He goes, "I love that song. It's Tinker Taylor." <laughs> <laughs> oh wow yeah stupid song in the world and he, he just got it oh man you know so we were at a gig at yale university true story um, i'm sitting in the audience we did the gig together and we're hanging out and having a load great guy he was having a great load of fun drinking this white lightning right <laughs> and anyway he goes on stage and he, amongst other things right and he gets on stage and he's playing away and he's and all this over here and then and then he comes to his pit and he goes and then off into something else and he looks down at me and goes how can he work that stupid thing in that he's just you know another be, I, mean, I, I would love if you could find the bootleg of that show uh, oh, i'd give anything i know i have a friend uh um yeah i have a friend who, who an engineer that i work with david uh mike uh, bosworth right 
Richard Bosworth, his name. He's out there, right? Hey, Richard. And uh, <laughs> we're really good friends. So Richard was at that gig, right? And he remember. I know he was at the gig because Jimmy had been out with some girl or something or other, and and he liked to steal his girlfriend's clothes and things, right? So he came in and he got white mate. You remember those white majorette drum boot? Those trail yeah, 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 yeah. The, the big heels. Yeah. No, the boots thing. You know, right? You know, you know, with the, with the baton twirlers and he wears okay, yeah, white yeah, yeah. Majorette, right? Yeah. So we know where he got them, but we never saw her again or a baton or anything else, you know. He <laughs> would say, and me, we're looking on, I'm looking on the stage going, what the hell is he wearing? He's got drum majorette boots on. I mean, get out of here, right? Oh, he's a funny guy. The funniest uh, guy. Yeah. That, I mean, you know, if you really look back for, being a 13 year old kid cutting a record in that tiny little studio and then all yeah. the experiences you had, you know, is there, you've done it. I mean, Isle of Wight, you've done festivals, you've done oh, giant yeah, I tours. I mean, what, what, I don't even, is there something left that you haven't done that you're like, I wish I still did, did that. I'd like to do the Isle of Wight again, just cause it's another demographic now, right? It's a whole right. different thing. And they, they want me to do it. Now we know we're in COVID and everything else and they're talking about it. And they wanted handprints and all this for the historic thing and all that, you know, whatever. And, uh, but I would love to do that. And I'd love to do Glastonbury again, gig wise. Right. I love it. Cause it's a thing about when you play those big gigs like that, I don't care young or old, whether you've done all this before and you're or whatever. You're as good as when you get up or what you do, you know. Yeah, it's, it's so big, deal, you know. I mean, the younger bands have, yes, a, a consolidated following, which, yes, you used to somewhat have that, and people had that, and things like that, yeah. But it's great to get up and just to get, just to get it going, right? There's such a rush to get it going, I tell you. I, I've done that so many times on them big, you know, when you got 200,000 people and things. And, uh, <laughs> I don't want to bore him to tears. I mean, if I think I'm boring them, I'll split. You know, I don't care. Right. But um, the, you, if you think that way, that you if you're boring them, you're getting off. You know, you don't want, you don't, you, they don't need it. They pay their money, you know. So, but you, you think of it in a way that you, you get out there and you're on your own. Hey, you want to hear a crazy small world story about um, Annette? Yeah. So I was yeah. on a podcast last week. Yeah. And, there was a musical guest that played after um, I was talking to the host yeah. and I had brought you up. So when the musicians uh -oh. came on, the singer said, I have the craziest story about Terry Reed. It's, and I'm like, what? And he said, you know, I'm a huge fan. And we were, our band was playing a gig in Williamsburg and we, I, we went to get a beer or something. And there was a woman there and her daughter, and we're talking and something came up and she's like, yeah, I'm waiting for my husband. He's playing a show. I'm like, who's your husband? And she said, Terry Reed. And the guy <laughs> flipped out and it was your wife and your daughter. Um, Where's Williamsburg again? I, I in, out no, near I Brooklyn. Think. Brooklyn. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, it is. Yeah. Yeah. I'm here. Yeah. Right. And uh, the band's called Okie Dokie. Oh. Right. Okay. I'll send you a link to the show and you can hear him tell the story, but it was crazy. <laughs> yeah. Crazy small world. Yeah. Isn't um, that true? Right? Really? But you know, look, I, 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 I was going to go, yeah, I knew her years ago. <laughs> no, 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 no. They, this is, this is recent. Um, yeah. but yeah, man, you know, look, I, I really appreciate you coming on the show and, and telling these great stories. I feel like I could yeah. keep this going for 10 hours and you wouldn't, well, like Run I say, I'm not, I'm not saying, I mean, I'm not like our Johnny Carson promoting a book, you know, but, but, uh, I really, I, I'll be honest with you, you know, you, that whole thing of writing a book, I got involved with this thing, like Johnny Depp, who's really, I know he's Johnny Depp, but he's a good friend of mine. And we work together, like, you know, with Joe Perry and, and that, you know, and he's a really, I like Johnny. He's a really decent guy. I mean, we get on really well and he, 
he really is a good cat. Yeah, I know he, they put him, they're putting him through hell at the moment, but there you go. <laughs> it's like with Jimmy. Right. I, I think about it like with Jimi Hendrix, you know, they put Jimmy through hell and he's the nicest guy in the friggin' world. Now, you've got a lot of assholes <laughs> that, quite frankly, get away with murder, right? You know right. what I mean, right? It's really wicked. And uh, he's going through this whole thing at the moment. But anyway, he's been very supportive of me. And when we were in the studio up at his place and that, we got on so well, it was like we'd sit talking about all this stuff, like me and you all the time, right? He said, right. so when you were doing, was that really true? I go, don't worry about it. <laughs> so <laughs> he's really endorsed this thing with a publishing company to get a deal, to do a book, and also get the, the video and film rights to do a thing that's a kind of film, you know? And uh, I don't know what kind of film, I don't know, you know? But I'd love to get like Cameron Crowe involved in that, who I've known for a long, I knew a long while ago, you know? And a lot of different people, there's a lot of different ways of looking at things, but it's not just about music and music stories. This is one thing, but there's the whole social relevance of that whole time that we lived through from that whole, from the sixties all the way through that I think is sort of really, I would say it's important. I think it's very relevant to what everybody does now. Right. Yep. I know everything changes. I mean, boy, I mean, thank God it does. You know, this is, I would, I, with my life, I definitely, they said, would you like to change anything? I said, yeah, most of it. Yeah, I'm <laughs> sure. You know. But what would you change it to? That's the thing. What would you change right. it to? I'm not really sure what you change it to. You, you know, you get what you get, you know, and uh, I'm happy, you know, I'm happy with, with what I got and, and I'm still, you know, playing songs and, and people are nice, you know, and, uh, and, uh, it's good, man. You know, it's good. Life's good. You know, you just gotta, that's good. Man. You just gotta yeah. enjoy it, man. And we're going through these tough times now. We, we ain't got, we, no, I can't even see you. Shit. Yeah. The last time I saw you was your birthday party. And that was exactly. a year ago. You now, know, you know, know so, after the birthday yeah. party, it all went down the tubes, you know, so yeah, uh, we we'll should have never though. turned 70, man. That you, <laughs> that's, I did it. Yeah. That's right. Yeah. yeah. No, but I, I, I look forward to when this is all done and, and coming yeah. out to the desert and seeing you or seeing you in LA or wherever. Yeah, but, anytime. Um, yeah. You know, you're you're someone I'm very thankful I met all those years ago at the joint and yeah, you're very you know, calm, really man. glad we stayed in touch and you know, got my wife to see it a show and, and all that good stuff. So be well, man. Um yeah. keep keep rocking and I'll see you soon. Yeah. God bless you, man. God bless you. All right, thanks, Terry. Thanks for tuning in to Rock on the Rocks. Be well, be kind, rock on.